welcome to the Underhive Workshop. Today we're going to talk about city fight walls and some other scatter terrain that you can use. However, really briefly, I wanted to touch on the way that terrain is used in play. So generally speaking, you have two different types of ways to play on tabletop. You have matched play and you have narrative play. Matched play is going to fall into a lot of your tournament-based wargaming. Pretty much, in my opinion, everything else falls into narrative play. That goes for role-playing games like Pathfinder and Dungeons and & Dragons, my personal favorite, Savage Worlds, or narrative 40k games, stuff like Space Station Zero, the other side of Stargrave, Kill Team, anything where you're not looking at setting up a balanced board that gives each side the same chance at utilizing the same terrain layout is going to fall into your narrative side. The other thing that's going to fall into narrative play is going to be scenario play. Whether or not that's a scenario you made up, or that's reenacting either something out of real world history or out of the game's lore, anything that follows a predetermined scenario. So there are a lot of cases in real world history where battles were incredibly unbalanced, either because of the forces that were being used or because of terrain and all of that. And then it was the brilliant tactics of one side or the other that actually showed through and won the day. With all that being said, as Underhive Workshop strives to be system agnostic, most of the stuff we focus on here, it's going to be narrative-based tips and tricks designed to make different types of terrain for your tabletop. In general, if you kind of go back and look at a two to three year spread, and sometimes it's even shorter, like a one year spread, of the way that the championship match play treats terrain, it changes almost yearly or every two to three years. That doesn't mean that that match play terrain that you made or that you're designing isn't going to be useful in the future. Generally speaking, it all kind of still works. Just the way to place it and how to place it and all of that changes a little bit. But it means that like diving in and designing a bunch of stuff to a standard that just came out can be kind of aggravating because it could change by the time you're ready to play with it for a couple of months on tabletop. So when looking at creating a ruin, whether or not it's a full ruined building or it's a couple of pieces of wall or it's a corner, you kind of want to set out with a couple of basic building blocks. And one of the best basics that I've found actually comes from Match Play a couple of years ago. The WTC standard had three-story and two-story ruined buildings, which I kind of go back towards. I gravitate back towards for a couple of reasons. One, you can use them as a good base and then pull them apart to build other things. And two, they actually make some pretty interesting bases or foundations for making modular terrain. I used the WTC standard a couple of years ago to make a modular manufactorum for Warhammer 40k. The idea being that you could either place them individually as chunks of building in matched play, or you could put them all together in one table and you could fight inside a manufactorum. Also, when approaching stuff like this, I always kind of keep in mind how can I use it in a tabletop role-playing game as well. I'm going to try to make my terrain fit as many applications as I can. And since I have a tendency to run either in post-apocalyptic or fantasy settings, I want to kind of gravitate towards things or build foundations that can fit both needs. So to go over the two-story and three-story setup, you essentially have an L shape. And the L shape is five inches on one side and nine inches on the other side. And then it's gonna have, like I said, an L shape. So let's say we come in about two inches and we're gonna come down and we're gonna go out and we're gonna have again about two inches. Then you can either put that on a base or you can leave it as is. I generally prefer to put mine on a base. So in this case, I would increase this side to 12 inches and I'll go over why in a second. And I would create increase this to six inches. And the reason I would do that is because I am always kind of looking at that 12 inch by 12 inch square. And this is a division of that 12 inch by 12 inch. So if I make two of these and I put them together, they become two modular pieces, which make a 12 inch by 12 inch board segment. The height, and this is kind of the tricky part, is nine and a half inches tall 
for a three-story building, and it's about five and a half inches tall for a two-story building. Now, obviously, for the three-story building, you're going to divide that by three, and for the two-story, you're going to divide it by two. But generally speaking, I'm going to help you guys out here, it's about three inches. It's a little over three inches. Each floor with this layout is about three and an eighth of an inch to three and three eighths of an inch tall. When you put a fig on the board, like so, here he is on the main floor. Go ahead and use a popsicle stick just to lay out where second floor is. So there's the second floor at three inch mark. So he's on the base floor. Now he's on the second floor. Now he's on the third floor. And then if you put a roof on it that they can get on top, that would be at nine inches. Or if he's just trying to hide from say a flyer or somebody shooting from the ground, he's underneath, his head is underneath the wall he's getting some sort of cover benefit. This also means by general movement rules, whether or not you're looking at a game like Savage Worlds, which has a pace, a general pace for everything is six, which is either six squares being one inch, one inch by one inch squares, just like my cutting mat here has. So in this case, if it's my turn, I would move six, one, two, three, four, five, six, or in the case of not having a grid battle square, six inches. So again, I would move six inches. In a height relation, it's assumed a lot of times, or you can build into your terrain, either ladders or steps. And therefore, if you're trying to get from the first floor to the second floor, it's going to take you three inches of movement. Meaning, if you wanted to, you could get all the way up to six. Based on the specific rule set or the way that terrain interacts with that rule set, it may not be you can move all the way up to the third floor in a turn. You can't necessarily go vertical six inches. There might be some restriction. For instance, in a game like Savage Worlds, maybe it's considered difficult terrain to climb, so you're going to lose one to your pace, so the max you can get is five, and five doesn't quite get you to the second floor or something along those lines. Or maybe, again, in a system like that, a tabletop role-playing system, maybe using a ladder helps you a little bit. In older versions of Warhammer 40K, as an example, if you were on a road, you could actually get plus three inches to your movement, so maybe a ladder in an older system may have given you plus two inches to your climb. So maybe you could get all the way to that second floor, or maybe even all the way to that third floor in just a turn. You're kind of playing around, or you're going to kind of have to be familiar with the rule set of the system you're using. But this is kind of, for the 32 millimeter hero, a very basic, easy way to look at it. You've got about three inches per floor. Now, back in the day, when I originally got into making Mordenheim terrain, I actually made everything two and a half inches per floor. And this, again, you can totally do. Obviously, you know, this Palantine Enforcer can still very easily fit in here. But I kind of prefer the three inch. And one of the reasons I prefer the three inch is because you can actually reach your hand in here and move it pretty easily after you've made a piece. As a final example, here is a two-story corner ruin that I made using these principles. Here's some of that what I was talking about. This actually allows guys to move up in a tabletop role-playing scenario more than a wargaming scenario and take cover on the outside of the building. There's some stuff they can hide behind. And I actually detailed out damage to give that idea of, oh yeah, there was somebody taking cover behind there. But this is that kind of standard where that first floor is just over three inches. It's about three and a half inches is the lower level of that floor. And then, of course, the floor has thickness to it. But it allows my guy to stand there on the main floor pretty well. And it allows him to stand on the second floor very easily. And then, of course, he can be on the roof. The reason I did this this way is because the idea behind this building set, this set of terrain that I had made, was that the main floors were bigger. The main floor was much taller than all of the floors above it. Because that's actually kind of something that you see in architecture, especially in these like sort of imposing governmental buildings. They'll have like floor and a half or even two floor main floors, these kind of big atrium entryways and stuff. It just gives a grandeur to it. Realistically, the big thing that you're worried about a lot is can I get my hand easily into it? And at two and a half inches, you're kind of squeezing. At three, you've got just about the right amount of room. The second floor is three inch. I can move in here pretty easily. 
There's a lot of detail in this, and I will go over how to make a corner ruin like this at some point, but I've got some floor tiles and all sorts of other stuff. But let's jump into the basics of just making a scatter wall. These are actually some scatter pieces that I created for City Fight at one point. They're pretty small. They're only about a base wide, but it just gives a little bit of narrative. Pieces of scatter like this may not actually give any terrain bonuses to the game. They may just be for visual appeal. In this case, you know, it's a little gun emplacement. It's got a couple of sandbags, and then there's a heavy machine gun there that just kind of suggests at some point during the narrative that happened leading up to the battle, this area may have been fortified. Scatter also allows you a lot of modularity. So in this particular case, I could put this little barricade here. I could put this machine gun here and I could kind of catty corner them out and I could bring in other things here's some more sandbags some weapons and a couple of oil barrels and stuff like that and it just kind of gives an idea that something was happening here scatter just builds into that immersion that doesn't mean that it has to be designed like this it can be designed a lot more like the pieces we did last week which would actually be used to block line a site or potentially give a little bit of cover with that in mind, we're going to be making something that is four inches deep by six inches long. And instead of making it a full rectangle, which we could very easily do, we're going to put it on an angle. So for this project, as in the past, my primary tools are going to be a square, a hot glue gun, a utility knife, and go back to that handy sanding stick because I'm sure it'll be useful. Pencil. I'm also going to use a white pen so you guys get kind of an idea and can see a little bit better. Plus other standard tools like an X-Acto blade or a hobby knife. I'm probably just going to stick to my utility blade for this one though. As far as materials being used for this build, I'm going to go back to using some gator board. Again, you can use poster board if you want or any sort of other foam core. I prefer gator board. I'll drop some links to how to buy some of this material on Amazon for you guys. I'm going to be using granny grating, which is just going to give us kind of an extra texture. Uh, I'm using a piece of scrap that I have because I cut out some other stuff for another project. I'm going to be using these cardboard tubes that I collected because I think they're going to add something unique and interesting to this piece of city fight terrain. And I'm going to use some of this corrugate, this one-sided corrugate. And that's just going to give me some textures to play with. I'm going to try to kind of make this look a little bit like a hastily erected barricade. And as always, things to kind of have on hand for detailing are going to be popsicle sticks or chipboard, my favorite material. So this piece of scrap gator board is actually a little bit bigger. It is six inch by about 11 inches. So because of that, and because I want to tell a little bit of a narrative story on this, I'm actually going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to add to the build. So originally I had sketched out that we were going to do four inch by six inch. And in this case, we're going to increase to five inches on the depth and we're gonna to increase to seven inches on the width. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because I'm gonna build a corner, and as part of that corner, I'm gonna build in a sidewalk. So we're gonna have a ruined corner of a building, but when you look at it from the top, the building is not gonna butt all the way up to the edge. It's actually gonna have an inch all the way around that's the sidewalk outside the building. And there's a couple of reasons I'm gonna do that. The first, is because that gives us something to play with. It can be used as a corner. Maybe it's a corner that there's a little objective hidden in. One of the things that I'll cover in the future is making little objective markers that are a little bit more interesting. You know, using the round foam ones really work, but if you want to make them pop narratively, you can actually drop something right there in the center to suggest, oh, well, there's a, a little portable radar dish there and you have to get to the portable radar dish that's what you're actually trying to get you're not just trying to get to the objective there's something in the objective you want but you could drop that again right behind that little corner just give it a little place to hide or possibly this is just something that you're going to put at the edge of a board maybe you're hedging in the edge of the board 
or whatever. There's a lot of different reasons why this little tiny corner piece might be useful. One of the things that I did in a past game that I had designed for City Fight was I made a couple of these corners and inside these corners there were weapon caches hidden. So you actually had to get a certain number of weapon caches to win the game. You can also do some detailing on the outside of the wall and on the inside of the wall, so having a little bit extra space always helps. One of the nice things about these metal rulers is that this skinnier chunk here is an inch, and this th thicker chunk here is an inch and a half. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat. I'm going to use the tool as much as I can, and I'm going to go ahead and draw in that inch border. There we go. Now I'm just going to measure everything out and I'm going to cut this up. Alright, so here is my base. I've got my one inch border all the way around, so that's going to be where my wall's going to go in. My wall is going to pop in right there. And then I'm going to go ahead and put some shape to this. So because I don't necessarily want it to be something that sits exactly on a corner, you know, this is some sort of ruined piece, I'm actually going to notch these edges. Again, the original was to do a six by four barrier. So cutting off a little bit excess on the outside isn't gonna matter. Just like with the logs, I'm gonna kind of sketch in a rough line of what I want, and then I'm gonna use my utility knife all the way out to kind of carve down to that shape. You'll notice there towards the end of shaping it, I brought out the sanding stick and that was just to kind of define and sand down a little bit more of my shape. As I mentioned earlier, that height of a full wall, so not a ruined wall, but a full wall is going to be three inches. So we're going to move with that to design what this is going to look like because we want that full height. So we're going to need at least a five and three quarters long by three inch tall piece. This is where it comes down to saving all of that cast off that I talked about, because I'm actually going to use the cast off. Rather than going to all those other pieces I grabbed, I'm just going to use this right here. So there's five and three quarter. I'm going to come up to three. I'm going to lay out my basic shape. There we go. So just for ease of looking at it, we're going to call this the base. So this is the edge that's going to get glued down. Now, if I just cut it out like this, it's going to be this really weird looking clunky rectangular wall on this ruined base. We're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to look at creating a couple of windows. So since this is the base, this is going to be this corner. So we're going to come in an inch again using the square to our advantage. So we don't have to actually measure out an inch. And then we're going to come up about an inch because the windows aren't going to be on the ground well, just to give you an idea. So that window is going to be just above his waist. That might actually be a little tall, but you know what? It probably works. All right. So then we're going to put in a window. All right. So we want to make a kind of sci-fi gothic horror window so what we're going to do is we're going to give the window some thickness so just because it's easy and we've already got the ruler here let's say each of these windows is an inch and a half wide we're going to give another inch 
between windows. The administratum, when they make these things, they're not, you know, they're not super precise. Or they're super precise, but they're not super artistic. So they just kind of slap them down, right? All right. And then we're going to give them that gothic shape. So to give them that gothic shape, we're going to come up about an inch, probably a little bit more of, than an inch. And then we're just going to make... All right, so that's actually a little wide. That, that goes all the way to the top, which I'm not super happy with. So I think we're going to make these windows skinnier. So we are going to do an inch and a quarter instead. And instead of worrying about the fact that we now have more than an inch into this wall segment, we're just going to leave it. So to be clear, this is an inch in from that corner. This is an inch up from the ground. One inch up from the ground. This is an inch and a quarter wide, which makes this now an inch and one quarter wide. And then we're going to do the same thing to this guy. So we're going to make this window also an inch and a quarter wide, just for uniformity. You know, they might not be super uh, bleeding edge architectural geniuses in the administratum, but damned if they aren't as precise as they can be. All right. So now we're going to make our shape. So we're going to find the center of this inch and a quarter. And then we're going to come up and we're going to draw our gothic window. Now I'm only going to draw one. And the reason I'm only going to draw one is because we are going to use this little gothic window shape I'm about to cut out as the template for this next one. like making those straight cuts you're going to go just as smoothly or as gently as possible making those curved ones multiple passes it'll get you the nicest cleanest cut and then just to kind of clean up the inside i'm taking the sanding stick and i'm working it down the other thing you can do if you want and i've done it in the past is you can actually go ahead and bevel these just gives it a little bit more of an interesting look it is time consuming though. So then this guy becomes the template for our next window. So we just put it right here. We draw around. There we are. There's our second cut. I'm gonna thicken up those lines just a little bit. Now the easier way or the more precise way, I guess you could say, to get this shape is to actually take a piece of paper, fold it in half and make one arch, cut it out and then lay it out. However, you know, we're cutting windows in a ruined city because they're, they're not going to be pretty when we're done. So. Again, save these. They can have dual purposes. One, they can be templates for future. Two, they actually fit 
into the space we left in between. So if you get around to wanting to do some detail, you've got a piece of detail that you could lay there. You know, obviously embellish it, change it up a little bit, but it gives you some dimensionality to it all. That and, you know, I always say save everything, so kind of roughly clean it up. Now, again, this looks more interesting than it did because there's some shape to it. You know, there's there's some details put in, but it also doesn't make a lot of sense that this totally pristine wall is going to be on this ruined chunk. So what are we going to do about that? We're going to cut off more of it. So this is that storytelling portion. So this was probably a two-story building at a certain point, and the roof has been ripped off. So that's going to come down and damage these windows. It's going to rip more material out. So we are not going to have a flat top by any mean. We're going to kind of come down. Try to keep in mind the way that buildings break. And I know that's kind of a weird thing to say. But if you look back at specifically like World War II pictures, pictures of damage that was done... Uh, Dresden, the city of Dresden is a great example. I'll probably continue to use it. A lot of those buildings had a tendency to like, when a corner was left, they kind of sloped away from each other. You know, that's the two corners were away from each other at an angle. They weren't just perfect. So I'm kind of looking at that, like these two walls where they meet is a very strong structural point. So it's more likely that they will have held each other up as to where this entire open area this middle area the further away you get from that structural support of the corner the more damage is going to happen the more is going to be missing so i think i like that i don't necessarily have to stick to it as i cut as stuff happens i might change my mind but All right, so you may have noticed as I went ahead and went through that process, I actually eliminated a lot more than I originally intended to, and, and that was intentional. As I kind of started telling the story and kind of looking at how different pieces would tear off of each other, I made little cuts, and then I actually tore the material. That gives me an idea of how it might break naturally. You know, Not that this is plywood with plaster on top of it and all that obviously it's not it's not the same building material but it does give you an idea it also allows you to kind of sort of tell a story obviously a lot more damage was done to this middle area of the building especially on this base there is no building over here so if something happened maybe a tank drove through it or something like that so more of the roof may have been pulled away more of the upper side had been pulled away i also made sure to keep all this cast off and there's a reason for this this is all going to turn into rubble but we now have to tell the story of this other piece of wall and not tell the story we also now we have to create the other portion of this corner so there's one of the corners now i'm going to have to go back to some raw material here some raw cast off here that looks like it's about right just about the right size so i'm just going to mark off that three inch tall and cut this to the size that I want.
All right, so you'll notice that I went ahead and laid out that one inch by one inch again, and then I took a piece of this, and I used the thickness of the material to figure out how much more I needed. And, and the reason I did that is because I'm going to glue them together like this, which means I'm going to lose the thickness of the material, which is about an eighth of an inch as I do that. So I want to move this line out an eighth of an inch. I use the material itself to measure it rather than the ruler, just because you never quite know. It says that's an eighth of an inch, and then it's like, it's just a little off. Then I'm gonna use this window template that I came up with, and I'm gonna go ahead and mark it in, and then I'm gonna need essentially another window length until the next window, and then as you can see, I'm almost gonna be out of material, so I'm just gonna kinda of hastily sketch that in because I'm not gonna actually have an entire window to cut out. Then I'm gonna lay these next to each other so I can figure out where the damage that I put on this corner is and make sure that I match it. So I'm gonna come up and in. I'm gonna hit that window. And then this damage is just gonna kind of rock it straight on down. That's gonna get to this little window edge here. And then we're gonna kinda, we're gonna come in. We're gonna make an overhang. Overhangs always look interesting. So we're gonna make an overhang. Somehow the material was ripped out. When you do an overhang, since they're kind of maybe not as natural as you would think, just have a little bit more at the bottom. Can help it, can help sell it. Now I'm also going to start with my major cuts as you saw and then I'm going to go back in and add that detailed stuff and this isn't even done this is just kind of the base that we're getting up to we're going to do a lot of the detail damage here in a second but this is pretty good and ready to glue on so take our trusty hot glue gun and assemble this guy. And there we have it. There's kind of our basic corner. So, you know, you could apply this to a single wall by not making it as high and only doing one length if you wanted to, like a barricade. And that's definitely something that we'll jump into a little bit later. Or you could do the full out corner like I did. And this is just, you know, this is the basic. We are done. We are ready to detail the shit out of this guy. Now, the first thing that I like to think of when I do the detail is what are the major things of damage that would happen? Well, the major things of damage that would happen is all the rubble from up above fell down onto this. A lot of times when you see wargaming terrain or any of this sort of terrain, there's not a lot of rubble inside or enough. There isn't enough rubble ever <laughs> is, is essentially how it goes. So to hint at some of enough rubble, what we're going to do is we're actually going to take all of this stuff that we did. We're going to chop it up. We're going to break it up into smaller pieces, and we're going to spread it around inside. So at the very least, we have the material that would have come off of this ruin itself as this ruin itself fell down in on itself involved. We might not have, you know, the four or five stories that we're imagining or 
or potentially could have existed above. We're not going to be dealing with the parts of the building that you can't see on the base. We're not going to be dealing with the stuff across the street. We're not going to be dealing with what may have hit it. We're just looking at the material we actually took out of the wall build while we were working on it. This stuff I'm ripping up with my hands, but again, you can use a utility knife or even a big butcher knife to kind of chop it up finely. You're kind of going for that diced or cubed um, look. And the smaller and finer you want to make it, the better. You can also make it thicker. At other times, I have gone in and I've put some other detail into, uh, you know, either suggest that there are tiles, like floor tiles that were inside, or maybe um, that kind of concrete look that you get on a sidewalk on the outside. But we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to we're going we're gonna to pop and make this a little bit more technical looking by using that granny grating. We're going to do that here in a second. But first off, I'm just going to prepare a bunch of this stuff. So there we go. We got kind of a pretty good little rubber, rubble pile there. Obviously, I got a couple more pieces, so if I feel like I'm a little loose or a little shy, missing some, it doesn't quite look right, I can mix that in. But I also have my favorite basing material of crushed coral and some different grits of sand that we can lay down, so there's ways to build it up. But first, let's make it pop by turning over to this stuff, this granny grating material. So I'm going to lay it down and figure out about where it is. And I can see... You know, you can see easily where the actual base is. You can cut this stuff pretty easily. You can cut it with a pair of scissors if you need to. I'm going to trim it real quickly, just kind of to shape. Again, it cuts super easily. But you can see, I'll flip it over to the back. That's a little big still. So now I'm going to kind of go in and detail out. This has kind of a grid shape, so we're going to rely on that grid shape for some of the damage. I'm going to make... The damage cuts and all of that kind of max, not max, match, excuse me, that grid shape kind of suggests that maybe some technical underlaying was put down. Or even possibly this could have been uh, a piece of like military building, possibly. This has a very technical look to it. So I'm just going to kind of cut it up. And I'm going to save all of this cast off and mix it into my rubble pile because I'm going to use it in my rubble pile. So you'll notice as I did that several times, I went back and I laid it in and I checked it and then I did some interior cuts and all of that. And that's just more of that storytelling. Now this stuff is actually kind of a pain to glue down. So this is one of those things that really, really, really go back to that glue gun. You're going to want that glue gun, trust me. So in this case, I'm going to try to put an incredibly thin bead down because I don't want to lose a bunch of that detail. And then I'm going to lay this in. You can put this down with PVA glue. You can put it down with super glue. You can put it down with some other stuff, but it has a tendency to kind of be a pain. It doesn't really like to adhere that well. I know a lot of guys kind of sandwich it in, or a lot of terrain builders kind of sandwich it in two different pieces, and that can work too. So there we go. We've got a little bit more interest, a little bit more going on. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put some of these popsicle sticks in. I lied. We're using one more piece of... We're using one more tool. We're going to use my, my wire cutters. And I'm going to put them down just to sort of edge this. Again, it gives it another piece of texture. 
I'm gonna make these some raggedish cuts. There's no reason for they would be. They'll be all damaged and screwed up too. Could even come in and damage up the edge if I wanted to, but I'm gonna put some rubble on top of it, so I'm not super worried. specifically made so I tried to make sure that there wasn't a bunch covering that one that one I'm not super worried about because it kind of extends underneath it so there gives some interest to the inside you know when I paint that up that's all gonna like kind of pop out you can do a bunch of other stuff at this point if you wanted to you could lay several of these down to give it more of a technical look you could add more detail if you wanted you could put piping and all that I'm gonna leave it as is because I think it looks pretty neat speaking of piping we're gonna come back to these guys. So, originally I had wanted to do something with them on the inside, and now I've kind of moved a little bit away from that. So at one point, there was obviously a pipe, it kind of went up along the ceiling, and it has just fallen down inside. So we're gonna add it as a big piece of rubble. I'm gonna mangle it up first. fell down from the second floor or maybe a, an unexplored piece of ordinance or something. All right, so now we get to the part of putting the larger rubble down. So to do this, we're gonna use PVA glue and we're gonna use all this little rubble that we kind of acquired, produced. And we're gonna focus on the interior for now. I'm just going to kind of put PVA glue where I think I want the majority of the rubble to be built up. I'm going to take this rubble that I produced and toss it in there. It's not all going to stay. Just kind of whatever sticks, sticks. And make sure to throw in this other stuff. Mash it and smash it and grind it in there. Get it around that pipe. Kind of trying to keep it to the edges because I still want figures to be able to kind of get up in here. But the beauty with doing several different layers of this and kind of building up is I can use the next layer, which is going to be the sand and coral layer, to kind of even that out. So I still have some exposed stuff. So I'm gonna pick and choose and press in some of this larger rubble. Kinda add pieces as I see fit. Placing this stuff individually doesn't make a lot of sense, but adding pieces individually can. I know, sprinkle it all on, kind of let it all sit. But if you find something that you really like and you really want to make sure it gets in there, go ahead and take it and shove it in exactly where you want it. You can even use hot glue if there's something you really, really want to make stick. All right, so now we get into the different grades of crushed coral that I've got. So I actually have a crushed coral that already has a bunch of bits in it. It's got some cork in it. It's got some of this gator board chunks in it and it's all just kind of mixed up. This is the first crushed coral I'm going to do on this piece. And then I'm going to move to this lighter stuff.
as I do each subsequent layer, I'm covering up more and more of the detail that I laid in, and that's fine, because that's very much what we're going for. We're going for that very layered look. You want lots of stuff. You want larger rubble and then smaller rubble and all of that. Again, these guys are now going to be able to kind of stand on this stuff a little bit better. It's going to give kind of a little bit more even of a basis. I also went ahead and added it to the outside. Originally, I had considered doing a bunch of outside detailing, <clears throat> you know, mixing in pieces like these to just give some dimensionality or something like that. However, as I kept looking at this piece, as I keep working on this piece, I really do kind of like the idea that it's almost this like mass produced, dropped in place administratum building. They didn't have a lot of time to do all of the extra things that would happen to the building before whatever happened happened. You know, these are prefabs that are dropped in. They're built really, really fast. And then based on their need, they're, you know, cut into, changed. If it's a governmental building, it's going to have a bunch of ornamentation on the outside. If it's a mechanicus building, it might have a bunch of like dials and gauges and computer terminals and all of that on the outside. But this very much was, you know, this building was dropped in and then whatever happened, happened. Maybe it's a hab block a prefab hab building you know dropped in didn't really get a lot of time we are going to detail the outside but we're also going to detail the outside from a reinforced position perspective so the idea that this has been just in this war-torn zone for long enough that the people fighting here have actually come in and reinforced it they've added armor they've added barricades they've added stuff to the outside all right, so while the basing is drying, we're going to add some texture to the outside of the walls and the inside of the walls. So this is playground sand. You can get it on Amazon. I'll have a link to it. Uh, again, 5, 10-pound bag, last two years. It's a little bit finer than what we've already put on, and it's going to give just a little bit of texture again to the walls. So what I'm going to do... So what I'm going to do is I'm going to coat the walls in PVA. You can use watered down PVA too for this stage, depending on how much or how little you want on. I'm just going to go for full on PVA because I want to get a bunch of texture on it. I'm not too worried at this stage. You know, I'm going to add some cuts and some damage and possibly some bullet holes and staining and all of that as I keep moving on. So I'm coating it, but I'm not going to worry about it being super thick. I'm going to spread all of that that I got on that one side over everything. If some areas don't get sand, they don't get sand. You know, nothing's perfect, especially in a war-torn post-apocalyptic hellscape. That's pretty coated. I'm also going to coat the inside of the windows. Anywhere where I can get some of this sand to stick is going to sell the extra texture that I'm going for. So I'm going to coat everything. And immediately tap it off. I'm not even going to wait for too long. What sticks, sticks. What doesn't, doesn't. And then since I've got it here, I'm actually going to go ahead and sprinkle it on the base, too. Again, immediately tapping it off. As I've been moving this thing around, since it's not fully dried, the glue is going to shift and move, and more of it's going to run and expose itself, which works pretty good. But as you can see, kind of get that stucco-ish look almost, which is sort of what we're going for. Give it a little bit of texture, something that the paint will pick out when you go over it. It will make it look as flat as just normal poster board or foam core. Some of it can be scratched off or dinged. You know, stucco isn't perfect, especially when it's being hit by things. Do it over these big bins because I want to save and reuse as much as possible. These are pretty handy. You can pick them up from Costco. I think they're like... They come in giant boxes. They're essentially 99 cents a piece. But of course, at Costco, you buy them in like packs of 50. You can get them at Home Depot, I think, for 99 cents as well. They're, I think they're Sterilite brand. All right, 
so we've got definitely some rubble going on here. Almost all of that floor detail I laid in is covered, but that's all right because some of it's peeking out. Also, all of that stuff in the background. And even if you are going to cover it all up, if it's not there and then it ends up being exposed, it's going to look weird later. That's just something I've kind of learned from doing this for this long. So at this stage, it needs some time to dry before I can do the damage like bullet holes or gouges or anything like that. And I want to do that after this step because I want it to take out of this stucco material just as much as anything else. However, as I mentioned, I want this to look like it's been fortified after the fact. And one of the ways that you could fortify something like this after the fact, or one of the ways that you can see that people have fortified stuff like this after the fact in, you know, either video games or post-apocalyptic movies or war movies is with the use of corrugated tin or corrugated steel. So we're going to come over to this corrugate stuff and we're going to cut out some basic rectangles and squares. And I'm going to kind of just eyeball this because it's not like this was being made by a precision machine. This is stuff that would be scrounged on the battlefield. I don't know. It's probably realistically being used a little bit more to block line a site than to provide cover, but maybe it provides cover against small arms fire or shrapnel or something like that. Don't want these to be necessarily 100% regular, but I want them to look like something that could have been easily cut up and then moved around so they all kind of fit into the same shape. Then I'm just going to figure out where I'm going to position them. Well, they've been used to reinforce, so they're going to be on the outside. So we're going to put one here, kind of covering up that old window that used to exist. I'm going to put it at an angle. It needs something that it was reinforced with or somehow, some way that it was used. So I'm going to take a couple of popsicle sticks and use them to suggest boards that were put up, nailed up, or stapled up, or leaned up. And I'm doing this right on top of this other material as it's drying. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want it to sink in where it needs to sink in. I want it to gouge out and do some of my destructive work for me. So from the outside, that looks like a nice covered piece. But on the inside, you know that that window is damaged. And that gives that dimensionality. You're, you're again, you're starting to play with the story that the piece tells from each side. It's also a good orc technique, a good orky technique if you're into Warhammer 40k orcs. It doesn't always, doesn't just work for post-apocalyptic. You can also make it an orc thing orcs in their corrugated metal and stuff like this in this granny grating material they really just offer so much detail so quickly they're kind of like great staples of the terrain builders box we've got a couple of pieces overlapped here so I'm getting textures moving in different directions They still want to be able to fire out of that window, right? So they're not going to cover it completely, but they are going to put up a little bit. And again, it doesn't necessarily matter that I'm covering up a bunch of detail underneath. One, the detail that I put in isn't super fine. It's not super precise. It's not like I 3D printed a bunch of pieces and now I'm covering it literally covered the entire thing with PVA glue and then dumped sand on it. However, in any places where this stuff slips or falls out of place or isn't aligned right, or when I get to the point of adding bullet holes and I'm tearing holes in this stuff, you're going to be able to see everything behind it. And it's going to be a lot harder to go in and fix it after the fact than to just sort of lay it in now. The other thing that I kind of like is I like the idea that maybe this position 
was hardened at one point, or not hardened, but like lived in at one point. So we're gonna add some tin to the roof. And we're gonna do that by building kind of a little rubble or found scrap material structure that these pieces can sit on. Here's where I'm getting to the layering. There's a lot of layering going on as I'm moving forward. I'm layering in on pieces underneath. I'm layering in on textures underneath. And if I didn't do it, if I didn't have those textures, those layers underneath, it would sell part of this short because you would be able to tell that there wasn't anything underneath it. And there's kind of two different principles. When they design like a video game character or something like that and they're trying to solve save polygons or when you're working on a big terrain piece and you're trying to save time find the places where you can cut steps if you're not going to see the inside there's no reason to do a bunch of detailing on the inside however if it is going to be a little piece of scatter like this it's not really going to be doing a whole heck of a lot for the game it's more of a narrative piece it's more of something that just looks neat looks cool so I want that storytelling to happen somehow. And the way to make that storytelling happen is to have all of these overlapped details. And of course, when you actually play on this board in your little narrative game, you just tell people, hey, you can't stand on top of it. It's not, it's not structural, guys. It's just, to, it's just to keep the elements off of whoever's bunkered down inside. Start of a fortified or scrap fortified ruined building somewhere in a city. This is Goblin King from Under the Hive of Madness here at the Underhive Workshop showing you one of the ways to create a ruined corner and some walls for your scatter on your tabletop, either for matched play or narrative play. I went with a little bit more of a narrative focus on this, suggesting that whoever may have been holding this position needed to reinforce it and kind of went and scrounged material from the city around it. So as I developed more pieces that would work with this set, and a set of terrain that I would create would be two to three pieces that all kind of follow the same theme, I would go along the same route. I would use the same materials, and I would kind of suggest through my building the same sort of stuff. And that way I just suggest it's all kind of from the same portion of the city. I'll be back in a future tutorial to show you how I add bullet damage to a piece like this and also to go over the paints and the washes I use specific to tr painting terrain. If you enjoyed this terrain tutorial or you found any of the information within it helpful, please go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button and share with anybody you think might be interested in viewing it. If you have a terrain project you would like to see in the future, please reach out to us and let us know. Easiest way to do that is through the comments. While our terrain tutorials are designed to be system agnostic, we do host a Warhammer 40k lore podcast called Under the Hive of Madness. New episodes are out every Wednesday. Our home for that is Spotify, but we can be found pretty much anywhere else you get your podcast fix. If you're interested in connecting to us, the best way to do that is through our Discord server. There'll be a link down in the notes leading to that. Lastly, if you'd like to support us and see us grow, you can do that at www.patreon.com slash under the hive of madness. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.